The late 1970s hummed with anxieties, a perfect breeding ground for Roque Theyu's siren song. In the whispering pines of St. Marie, Quebec, he carved a haven called the Ant Hill, promising salvation from a prophetic apocalypse in 1979. Roque a défrayé les manchettes depuis le début des années 80 pour les nombreux sévices qu'il a infligés à ses adeptes. C'est injuste qu ce qu'ils nous font. Roque Theyu was born on May 16, 1947, in a French-Canadian family and raised in Thetford Mines. As a child, Theyu was considered to be very intelligent, but dropped out of school in the seventh grade and began to teach himself the Old Testament of the Bible. The end was coming, the end of the world. Judgment Day. Religious leaders throughout the ages have employed the fear of God to bring disciples to their knees, as Rock Theriot did in Quebec in the late 1970s. So that's why, you know, he had a good reason to make us believe that, uh, you know, we are special and we have to believe that, and we're the lucky one, we'll be saved, you know. Saved from the wrath of ancient prophecies, perhaps, but now living in fear of the most punishing cult leader of modern times. Seemingly normal people, complicit in savage mutilations, even the deaths of their babies. Theyu converted from Catholicism to the Seventh-day Adventist Church in January 1977 and began practicing the denomination's regular holistic beliefs, which encouraged a healthy lifestyle free of unhealthy foods and tobacco. In the mid-1970s, Theyu convinced a group of people to leave their jobs and homes to join him in a religious movement. Theyu formed the cult in 1977 in St. Marie, Quebec, with the goal to form a commune where people could freely listen to his motivational speeches, live in unity and equality, and be free of sin. I was wondering who I really was. I was wondering who I was wondering where I was coming from. And, and all of that misery, uh, you know, that uh, saying to myself, no matter what I touch, everything, you know, becomes a failure. I felt someone looking at me in a such a way that I had the, the feeling that uh, his look was like uh, transpersing me. I never, you know, felt that, uh, such a look before. So I asked the, to uh, one of the people who were with him to, to fix uh, an encounter and the sooner the better. These are my concubines. We love God, and of course, we love one another. One of the babies out of the communist died. What? That baby died of crib death. He's a worker from the government. You get the fuck off my land. He promised to cherish you and protect you forever. He promised to show you the way. And tell the police what you saw at the commune. That would be the end of me. She's the devil's bitch herself. Hey, blue eyes. Always looking for trouble. Always in heat. The children from the Church River Commune are victims of systematic physical and mental and sexual abuse. I told them already nobody did this. He's the prophet Moses. You're gonna get hurt. You're gonna hurt the people that you most want to help. As long as you agree to have nothing more to do with Mr. Terrio, we will not take the children away from you. Moses shows us the way to God. Get in the van now! I have inflicted on myself mental wounds which have left invisible scars that I will carry inside forever. What have I done? He made a necklace from a rib. I and I alone was the leader of that commune, and I take full responsibility for any and all misdeeds. He's not God. He's just another fucking asshole. He said that he had um, gifts, that he met God, he experienced God in his life, and um, he was he had visions, and uh, and as he was very bright, he was able to really, to really. He was about to avoid any suspicion from me. He prohibited the group from remaining in contact with their families and with the Seventh-day Adventist Church, as this was against his cult's values of freedom. 
Theru's fear of the end of the world grew, claiming that God had warned him that it would come in February 1979 and use the commune to prepare for it. In 1978, in preparation, Theru moved his commune by hiking to a mountainside he called Eternal Mountain, in St. Jogues, in the sparsely populated Gatsby Peninsula, where he claimed they could all be saved. Rock decided someone had to pay. He singled out a scapegoat, one of his more strong-minded women, Solange Boulard. He dragged her into the forest. And uh, what I heard, it was a horror. And I thought, and when she came back, she was, I mean, covered with, uh, with loose and in a very pitiful, very beautiful state. And he, and he told us because the devil was in her and he had to get rid of uh, the devil in, in her. Unconvinced that Solange's spirit had been purged, Rock ordered her to undergo one of his kitchen table surgeries. For Solange, there would be no escape and no report to authorities. In fact, it wouldn't be discovered for almost a year that Solange Boulard was dead. There, they remade the commune build their own town while he relaxed, comparing them to ants working in an anthill, naming the group the Ant Hill Kids. In February 1979, when the apocalypse did not occur, people started questioning Theru's wisdom. But he defended himself, saying that time on Earth and in God's world were not parallel and that therefore it was a miscalculation. To expand the community as well as to keep the members devoted, they remarried and impregnated all of the women, fathering over 20 children with 9 female members of the group, and by the 1980s there were nearly 40 members. Followers were made to wear identical tunics to represent equality and their devotion to the commune. In 1984, the group relocated to Quebec to a new site near Burnt River, a hamlet in central Ontario now part of the city of Kawartha Lakes. Following the cult's formation, Theru began to move away from being a motivational leader as his drinking problem worsened, becoming increasingly totalitarian over the lives of his followers and irrational in his beliefs. Members were not allowed to speak to each other when he was not present, nor were they allowed to have sex with each other without his permission. Theru used his charisma to cover for his increasingly abusive and erratic behavior and none of the other members questioned his judgment or openly blamed him for any physical, mental, or emotional damage. If a person wished to leave the commune, Theru would hit them with either a belt or hammer, suspend them from the ceiling, pluck each of their body hairs individually, or even defecate on them. The Anhill kids raised money for living by selling baked goods, and members who did not bring in enough money were also punished. Over time, Theru's punishments became increasingly extreme and violent, including making members break their own legs with sledgehammers, sit on lit stoves, shoot each other in the shoulders, and eat dead mice and feces. As David Wolf explains, it's not that difficult to convince people to believe in you. If I wanted to do that tomorrow, <laughs> I would find something I thought people needed. Uh, and it's usually some basic emotion. They need affection and love and attention and resources. And I would provide that to them, and I would little by little block out the other stuff that they have and convince them that this is better for them. And one day they wake up and realize they're totally controlled by it but can't get out. A follower would sometimes be asked to cut off another follower's toes with wire cutters to prove loyalty. The abuse extended to the cult's children who were sexually abused, held over fires, or nailed to trees while other children threw stones at them. One of Theru's wives left a newborn child, Eliezer Lavalli, outside to die in freezing temperatures to keep him away from the abuse. Theru attempted to backtrack to the original religious mission of the commune, beginning to strongly believe in purifying his followers and ridding them of their sins through abusive purification sessions where the members would be completely nude as he whipped and beat them. Theru claimed to be a holy being and started performing unnecessary amateur surgical operations on sick members to demonstrate his healing powers. The surgeries included injecting a 94% ethanol solution into stomachs or performing circumcisions on the children and adults of the group. In 1987, social workers removed 17 of the children from the commune. However, Theru faced no repercussions for his abusive acts. In 1989, when follower Solange Bollard complained of an upset stomach, 
Thayru performed another amateur surgery without anesthesia. He laid her naked on a table and punched her in the stomach, then forced a plastic tube into her rectum to perform a crude enema with molasses and olive oil. He cut open her abdomen with a knife and ripped out part of her intestines with his bare hands. Feyru made another member, Gabrielle Lavelli, stitch her up using needle and thread, and had the other woman shove a tube down her throat and blow through it. Bollard died the next day from the damage inflicted by the procedures, claiming to have the power of resurrection. Feyru had his followers saw off the cap of Bollard's skull, and he ejaculated onto her brain. When Bollard did not return to life, her corpse was buried a short distance from the Ant Hill Kids commune. Lavallee underwent harsh treatment at the Ontario commune during the late 1980s, suffering welding torch burns to her genitals, a hypodermic needle breaking off in her back, and eight of her teeth being forcibly removed. Lavallee attempted to escape from the commune after Theru cut off parts of her breast and smashed her head in with the blunt side of an axe, but upon her return, he removed one of her fingers with wire cutters, pinned her hand to a wooden table with a honey knife, and then used a cleaver to amputate her arm. In 1989, Thayru was arrested for assault after Lavallee had fled the commune again and contacted authorities, effectively dissolving the Ant Hill kids. Provincial authorities held long suspicions about Thayru's cult due to the particularly primitive living conditions of his membership. But because the commune was officially registered as a church, officials were legally unable to investigate the adults and could not do much except ensure the welfare of the children. Thayru was found guilty of assault for the amputation of Vali's arm and received a sentence of 12 years imprisonment. The vast majority of the cult's followers abandoned Thayru after his arrest, but during his imprisonment, he had fathered another four children with remaining female members during conjugal visits. Lavalli's report allowed further investigation into Thayru's actions, exposing the wider abuses at the communes and Solange Bollard's murder. In 2000, Thayru was transferred to Dorchester Penitentiary, a medium security prison in Dorchester, New Brunswick. In 2002, Thayru was rejected for parole as he was considered too high risk to reoffend, and he never applied again. In 2009, Thayru tried to sell his artwork on a United States website, murderauction.com which called itself a true crime auction house, and was willing to sell some of Thayru's drawings and poetry. The Correctional Service of Canada prevented Thayru's works leaving Dorchester Penitentiary, and Stockwell Day, the Canadian Federal Public Safety Minister at the time, wrote to the Correctional Service to express concern that the killer was benefiting from work in prison. On February 26, 2011, at age 63, Thayru was found dead near his cell at Dorchester Penitentiary. His death is believed to be the result of an altercation with his cellmate, Matthew Gerard MacDonald. A 60-year-old convicted murderer from Port Au Port, Newfoundland, and Labrador, who was charged with the killing. MacDonald pleaded guilty to second-degree murder and was sentenced to life in prison, having already been serving a life sentence for a previous murder charge. McDonald had stabbed Thayru in the neck with a shiv, walked to the guard station, handed them the weapon, and proclaimed, that piece of shit is down on the range, here's the knife, I've sliced him up. 